Hi, everyone. Welcome to eLearn Chat, where talk, it's knowledge. And today we're joined by Chris Wingerden from Domino. And that's www. Well, actually, no, it isn't. It's https colon slash slash domino.com. D-O-M-I-K-N-O-W. Hi, Chris. How are you? I'm very well, Rick. How are you doing today? I am doing great. And I'm so glad you could join us. It's been oh, about four years since last we saw you and you were just building a ton of functionality into it. And from what we're seeing, you guys mm -hmm. have just done an awesome job. But before we get started, uh, we couldn't, we didn't have Leslie on board today. She was having audio issues that were causing a very loud screech. So she'll be back next week. We'll try to figure out what happened to her audio. And uh, let's run our intro real quickly, our intro real quickly. And we are back. So Chris, last time we spoke, you guys were, were pretty much going up that ramp of success, doing some really good stuff with, with Domino and Claro. And what, what have you guys been up to in, in these last three, four years? Yeah, I, it was kind of fun when you guys reached out, uh, and I thought, wow, it has been a bit um, since we since we last chatted. And uh, we're not a group that sits on our laurels very long. We do certainly like to make things different as often as we can and keep moving forward, uh, thinking of new things to help people do, etc. Um, so we, you know, we've got a lot of different things that we've done product-wise, um, and also some really nice um, community building too. Um, maybe I don't know. The thing, the thing that's got me the most excited the last little while is that we've had uh, Brent Schlenker from uh, longtime uh, e-learning yep. build team member, and um, he's actually joined us as our community manager. Oh, great! Um, and so that's been a really cool thing for us. Um, and that started like at the beginning of the year and uh, in the last, I don't know, I think we're up to 10 now. Anyway, the last eight or 10 weeks, Brett and I have been doing a weekly uh, video podcast ourselves that we're calling Instructional Designers in Offices Drinking Coffee, which is a bit of a, a riff on the Jerry Seinfeld thing. Yep. Uh, but what actually makes us happiest about it is that it, by coincidence, the hashtag is actually idiotic if you <laughs> read the words which brad and i both heard that you know someone from our team pointed that out and we kind of went yeah 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 that that, that sounds like about us so, that is uh, classic you know it's yeah, funny so, just just this morning we were watching a video from um uh, oh who is it the, the um it was about village idiots and we were talking about idiotic and stuff because they got degrees in idiocy and i was laughing my head <laughs> off watching that so you have a very it's a funny url that's good that's or a funny name that'll that'll attract people for sure yeah for sure we do it on wednesdays um we're running it through crowdcast so folks who want to right. join us live or follow us <laughs> there can do that um plus then after the the recordings are being posted to our youtube channel youtube.com slash domino and just uh yesterday or today we got accepted into the um itunes podcast oh good um also looking to add google plus and spotify in the next few days with their um podcast lists too their approval processes are a little bit well that's but, great uh, brent's a, a good friend i know brent pretty well and yeah and I didn't know where he was going to wind up and where he was going to go. And he's been quiet for a while. So I didn't hear about him joining, joining you guys. But that's great. That's, that's a good move on his part and probably a really good one on your part. So yeah, he's been, a good guy. Been, yeah, yeah he, he's, you, can't, you can't help but like and yeah. Brent and be enthusiastic <laughs> when he's around. Um, he certainly brings a really nice energy and warmth. Um, and although we're a tech company, I think a lot of our, you know, we have so many long-term clients, et cetera, that... We really are kind of a people company that way. We're definitely a relationship, yep. long-term relationship company, and I think he fits into that really nicely and is going to help us really um, boost up our, our community kind of culture uh, within our client base. So yeah, that's wonderful. I'm glad for you. Yeah, like you were saying, you know, if you're mad at at, at Brent, somebody once said that just means you you hug him less. So. <laughs> I like so, that. Yeah, he's, he's, that. he's a great guy. So that's, that's a good addition. I'm yeah. glad for you. Congratulations to, to both of you. Yeah, we're really happy with that. It's been And it's been great so far getting him ramped up. And, and as I say, the, 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 the video podcast weekly uh, is a lot of fun too. So Now, one question that we've heard from different people throughout the years is a lot of people ask if you're an, a lean learning authoring tool or if you're an LCMS. And I think you're actually both. We, we definitely are. I mean, the history, um, in 2002, we actually rolled out the first version of our product. 
And we called it an LCMS, a learning content management mm -hmm. system at that time. And then by about 2009, which I think was our fifth release, um, major release at that point, we took a real strong step back because it had become lots of stuff you could do with it, but it was kind of a technical tool and it was very complicated to use. So we stepped back and re-engineered how people, you know, work with it. Our um, our development team had the mantra: let's create uh, a desktop tool experience, but in the browser. Mm -hmm. um, and so when we rolled the next version out, that's when we productized the name to Claro, and we thought we'd simplify the conversation a bit by describing it more as an authoring tool. But it's always it, it was still and it remains today very much a, a learning content management system. But we we put that stuff more in the background. The focus really is on helping people author really good content first, as opposed to putting or imposing maybe the, the content management aspect of things, putting that in, in, in your way uh, to get started. So it's very much you know, with client teams of, of one author, the content management isn't such a big thing for them. But when you get into teams of, um, you know, a few hundred authors working together around the world, well, then it's very much, you know, showing its LCMS heritage there for sure. Sure, that's great. And and I noticed I was on your website earlier, and you have different different pricing schedules. You've got professional enterprise. It was one of the middle. I can't remember what it was called, um, but. So it just basically depends on what people want, what they get, There's several features. Sounds like Enterprise was all of the other features and probably just bigger uh, number yeah, of users. Yeah, the, the way we're structured really is more around uh, the services you need to support for okay. the relative size of your team. So um, that involves, uh, you, you know, different server arrangements. If you're a big team, obviously you need more, you know, server type resources and storage, et cetera. Um, and you know, most of our clients, uh, the vast majority of them, uh, have us have a, are using our product in a hosted model where we are mm -hmm. doing the hosting and then, you know, scaling things out to to match their needs. Um, we we have only a couple clients left anymore that actually have the tool installed on their own server okay. systems. So that's good. Well, with the web nowadays, it's so nice to just go host and not have to worry about it. Yeah, it takes a lot of burden off of a lot of folks and simplifies a lot of things, even just software updates. It just, you know, we just do them and people don't even have to, you know, think no, about downloading them. So That's great. Now, I gather your, your clientele is pretty much worldwide right now. Yeah, we're really lucky. We have um, a lot of really nice teams, uh, you know, working around uh, around the world. So our team might be making some content in the UK and they're signing off at the end of the day and uh, the North American team continues on stuff and and then on to the Korean and the Japanese uh, you know groups within the same organization doing their content so um, and, you know we have a lot of clients in that in that kind of range but we also do have a lot of smaller teams because there are really a lot of e-learning is uh, you know one or two people working on projects at a time too so we we kind of span the whole gamut of team size for sure that's great now were you one of the founders of the product no, but I am currently the second most long, longest serving team member, uh, short of our CEO, who was actually uh, one, of the old, one of the original developers of the product, for sure. <laughs> oh, that's so. great. That's great. Now, you were going to show some stuff today. Yeah, I, I thought we'd uh, show off a few things. So let me just do the screen share here. And let's go to that one and do that. There we go. That should be good now. There you should go. We, we can see you. Screen? Yep, perfectly. Yeah. So I, I just happened, you know, there's our idiotic channel on crowdcast, <laughs> crowdcast.io if anybody's interested in that. Um, but let's, um, you, you know, so one of the things that we've done in the, the most recent couple of years that we're really quite proud of is um, we've added a whole new way to author content. Um, to what people can do. So uh, maybe what I'll do is I'll just quickly talk or show, you know, Claro, which we've always been able to do. Claro is our authoring mode for um, for uh, a traditional kind of e-learning. Mm -hmm. Sorry, lost my train of thought for a moment there. So things that are, you know, kind of PowerPointy in, in their heritage, um, everything we're doing in the platform has always been since 2011 forward. Everything we're making is all HTML and HTML5 based. Mm -hmm. So there's no issues with content showing up on a mobile device. But you know, if you think about PowerPoint, um, you know, you've got a specific page dimensions. The page has a height and a width. And um, when you see this kind of content, Claro content or a video, anything that's got that kind of a shape to it, um, it just gets bigger or smaller. 
um, on the page. So, you know, Claro, which was our, you know, what we rolled out as 20, in 2011, is still our probably most popularly used authoring mode, makes traditional e-learning what we'd probably call slides-based kind of, uh, mm -hmm. you know, e-learning content. But Two years ago, we rolled out our flow authoring mode, which is our true responsive authoring mode. Mm. It's quite a bit different than Claro, um, based around the whole idea of responsive web design, modern web design, and uh, really opens up a whole uh, range of really cool content options for you beyond just making content that is you know, contained in a frame or contained in a box like mm -hmm. traditional e-learning is. Um, let me just, um, sorry, trying to decide what to do. Let's go. So, you know, Claro, pretty familiar authoring environment. Lots of folks um, are familiar with it. But if I just jump to a flow authoring option, um, and we describe them as authoring modes, they're mm -hmm. all in the same tool. You're not, um, you know, shutting something down and, and then launching something else. They're, um, they're housed in the same tool. So no matter what kind of content you're making, you're still accessing the same uh, media library of, of say, in, pardon me, image assets and, and those sorts of things, which really makes, you know, that's where the learning content management system right. aspect of things starts to, to play out. Um, but what's really cool about um, our flow authoring mode is that you can make uh, one page of content and you can have it take care of all kinds of different behaviors based on the, the width of the screen that it's being viewed on or the width, the width of the browser that it's being viewed on. So the page doesn't have a specific set of dimensions because it can fit all kinds of different uh, dimensions. Um, so as you're authoring, you can actually see it at different screen widths by shrinking. Um, in the responsive design world, these are called breakpoints. So they're mm -hmm. screen widths that can be used to trigger behaviors in your page. And this page here, we've got this kind of one, two column kind of thing going on, right? 50-50, text is on the left, a bit of a translucent panel, the background image, we're kind of using the negative space to highlight the background image a bit. But if you were looking at this on a smartphone, a really skinny device, um, you know, held vertically, that two column kind of approach is going to look, well, it's going to look kind of bad and ugly. So this page, when it goes down to being a smaller size, it switches itself to being uh, one column. So instead of trying to keep that half and half ratio, um, we just give the priority over in this case to the um, to the main content that needs to be you know viewed and usable. Um, now there's a couple of other options in the e-learning world for responsive content, but most typically uh, some of those options anyway are, are all about making multiple pages and then delivering a, a you know a different size page to different devices. Right. But with us. We describe it as true responsive. You can see as I pull this uh, page wider, pixel by pixel, you can see that the page is, is actually changing and adapting. So you know, the beauty of this approach is no matter what screen size someone is looking at it at, if I have to change one of these words or do an update, it's being it, it's going to be reflected there. I don't have to make it you know four times once for each mm -hmm. of the breakpoints, for example. So. Um, so this really lends us to, it's, you know, it's related to and tied to uh, what you're seeing in a lot of the web browsing experience these yeah. days. If you go to a product, you get into more things that, you know, you're more into a page uh, design where you're scrolling down through the page, uh, reviewing content in sections, as opposed to a more old school uh, website, which, you know, has the menu and, and mm -hmm. 52 content pages <clears throat> tucked right. in different menu options and stuff like that. So. It really breaks the mold, we feel, for, for what, you know, what you can do with e-learning content. So, and, it, and it gets rid of the horrible page one of 868. Well, so. that's the cool thing. I mean, you can totally, I got a couple of samples loaded up here. So you can totally still make something that's kind of e-learning, -y, traditional, you know, yeah. with the forward and back buttons. But you can also start leveraging that longer page experience mm -hmm. now. Um, as part of the actual experience. So, you know, there are eight sections that you can see in the counter in the upper corner. There are eight sections on this page. Well, if we were using PowerPoint or a traditional e-learning tool, even our own Claro, you probably would have been making eight different pages um, and then the learner would be pushing the forward button. But mm -hmm. the ability for you to, you know, segment content out, uh, including different interactive components that's nice. And, and again, people are very used to dealing with web pages. Yeah. And, and this nature, I, mean, was, I was actually working on a, on a piece today, uh, an article that I'm writing, you know, thinking about how 
um, early web design, really scrolling was 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 taboo, right? Mm -hmm. we, we didn't want people to have to scroll too much. But the way that mobile devices, in particular, with the touch screens, right. have just changed the way that we think about interacting with content. You have the, uh, you know, the whole ability to just. Um, make that it, it just ties into being a native web experience now. We're not sort of boxed in anymore. So you, you wouldn't believe how many instructional designers we know who are still mourning the death of the rollover. Oh my God! On mobile. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, we we. Uh, do you know what? I, I mean, uh, a little bit of a story, personal story. Um, about four years ago now, the first time that the team gave me access to the flow authoring option and it was a very primitive version at that point it was basically the earliest sort of prototype where you could make something um, and I you know I had probably been working for 15 years in um, in e-learning design um, had that you know I, I knew what I knew to do in those kinds of tools and they gave me this tool uh, to play in and I got mad I was really <laughs> angry actually uh, and, and it's something I mean uh, partly um, partly because of the primitive nature of the tool, uh, but a lot of it was really just a change in mindset because mm -hmm. responsive web design is, um, it's a different way that the pages are structured. Right. So it comes with a new set of design rules and for someone who's coming out of PowerPoint or used to making a button that then shows a, you know, a pop-up on the page over other content or, or those kinds of things, well, it, it takes you back a step and says, well, we don't really have the same sense of layers because we can't put things in an exact place anymore because we don't know, depending on what device, where things are going to be. So you, you kind of step back and say, wow, I can't do that thing that I used to be able to do. But then there are tricks and, and ways to, to learn to think differently. And I have to say, um, after about three weeks in the tool originally, um, I walked into um, our CEO's office one day and I said, okay, I get it. I've made something and I saw how, how amazingly different yeah but still completely cool it could be on my screen, my big screen, as well as my phone. And I went, okay, now I get where this is going. I don't feel a loss anymore. I totally see the power of this, uh, you know, to, to move us beyond, you know, the thing that we've always been doing. So, And also, and, one of the things ahead. bad with, with traditional e-learning design is, you know, everybody talks about interactivity. And then you have the, 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 the crutch, I, I call it the development crutch of, saying, well, you hit the next button, that's interactivity. No, no, that's torture after a while. And especially when you have to tell the person on each page, press the next button to continue. And it just gets boring. And after a while they go, why are you telling me every time? And then if you don't tell them, they sit there and wait. It's, it's a scary situation. That's why I prefer if we didn't have next buttons, life would be a better world. Um, well it's funny when when we started carrying our, our mobile devices around and, and mm -hmm. downloading apps and you look at how 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 little information some apps actually give you to, to work with yeah. you know to, to get started and yet somehow we figure out how to navigate yeah. that but but we still feel like in e-learning we need to you know uh, we need to make sure that all the bases are covered because what right. if someone doesn't figure out that that little arrow going in that direction is actually the forward <laughs> button so <laughs> Now, mind you, I, we've had, I've said this many times on the show, we've had people, doctorates in fact, uh, who well, literally we got at least two phone calls throughout the year saying, uh, what do we do? We've been sitting here for 90 minutes and we don't know what to do. And they're sitting waiting for something, somebody to tell them, click the next button. Uh, uh, and you're just going, wait, you're a doctorate and you, oh my gosh. Um, and it's true. I mean, we've had that at least twice and, and uh, it's scary. It's a little scary. Yeah, I mean, there are still um, folks who are maybe not native digital savvy right. uh, folks right. who didn't grow up quite so much with, with some of this or, or yep. as comfortable. So, I, you know, I, I recognize that we do need to make sure that we're providing help where needed. But um, then again, so much of the web is just pretty much straightforward these days that uh, yeah. it does seem and, kind of funny and, to and have. And what to I like about design, the way you've shown it here, is that it has a nice free flow content heading down so you can easily scroll down, but mm -hmm. it's not static in the way it looks either. It, it's kind of nice, flowy, lots of good white space, uh, and it just feels comfy. I like that. It's just, you know, it kind of lends itself to you paying attention rather than just going, what's next, 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 next. Uh, quite a difference. 
And just being able to do things like use different backgrounds to sort of segment mm -hmm. the content out and chunk it a bit um, helps break that up. Uh, something we didn't see because I'd actually, I did, I should have reloaded beforehand, but you know, there are entrance effects. So as the content comes down and you see that in websites, content mm -hmm. you know, might slide in or sweep in. So there's right. still that visual engagement, that sense of life, uh, you know, to the page that sort of also kind of teases you a little bit. Hey, what's it going to do next as I go down? So, yep. you know, a, a sample like this that might be eight pages in a traditional learning tool if someone's doing the practice activity at the end and they want to re review some content they just scroll up quickly and, and check it out and they don't do the push the back button wait for the page to load push right. the back button wait for the page to load that kind of slowness too so it's you know something like this designing your lessons um in in these you know in a smaller sort of continuous page kind of structure is I feel it offers advantages to learners too how, how do you feel the instructional designers or writers whoever is writing it react to this it's been fun to watch. Um, depends on where folks are coming from. You know, folks who are, um, you know, very much invested in that more traditional um, content in a frame of, of e-learning, um, they, they do kind of go, well, here's something that I want to do. I want to do, um, well, here, here's a good example, drag and drop. You mm -hmm. can still totally do a drag and drop activity. Right. Um, but if the page is suddenly now being viewed on a, on a smaller device, mm -hmm the things you're dragging and dropping might not actually be visible just right. because of the way that the page adapts. So yeah. is that a positive experience for someone in that context? So you start having to think about, well, do we do something differently? Have the page changed so it's not doing a drag and drop for those users? Or, mm -hmm. you know, is drag and drop, you know, something that we really need to have? Are we using drag and drop even for an instructionally valid reason? Um, if all we're using drag and drop for is to have people sort words into categories or something, well, there's other ways maybe to, to achieve those same kind of ends for, from a, an instructional perspective too. So, so you know, some people feel a, a sense of uh, the difference they feel initially is, is a sense of loss. Um, that said, any of the, the teams that are, uh, we find that are, you know, coming from a certainly a stronger web design background, they, they glom onto this immediately. They go, yeah, this is modern web design. Mm -hmm. and, yep. and the thing for us too is that, you know, we also still offer Claro, which works in that traditional mode. You can make content in either mode, whatever, you know, sort of suits your purpose. Now, can um, you make content in Claro that then converts to this easily? Well, no, you, you can't. Okay. Um, Claro is more like working in PowerPoint. Got it. And uh, this kind of content is more like working in a Word doc in a sense. If you think of the way that content sort of scrolls down and et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, so there, and the, the technology behind the page structures is, is dramatically different. Okay. So they don't, they don't switch from one to the other. It, it, there's really no reasonably simple way to say, turn this into that. So, but you know, that said, our Claro content is still all HTML and HTML5 based. So there's okay. no issues with it showing up on mobile devices. Right. It's just like a movie that gets bigger or smaller, mm -hmm. you know, depending on the screen that you're viewing it on. So, yeah. Anyway. One of the other cool things about Flow is that uh, as we worked on it, we, we reached a realization internally um, that's actually led to a bigger change in our own thinking too. And, and that is that we're not limited to making um, e-learning courses anymore. We're, we're now making content and an e-learning course is just one of those things that mm -hmm. you can make. So, you know, you can totally use the, the tool to make things like um, a, a responsive infographic that might be a single standalone piece of content. Doesn't have to even be a SCORM package. You can deploy it as a, as a website, uh, you know, as a job aid, for mm -hmm. instance or content that is actually um, deployed as a searchable knowledge base. What we have added are um, a set of different navigation frameworks. So if you're doing the course, if it's an e-learning course that you're kind of making, well, you get the top bar with the forward and back buttons. If you're doing the, the vertical page, well, we have the up and down kind of structure. Mm -hmm. This is our knowledge base framework. So you choose the knowledge base framework. It takes the content structure that you've created, builds this menu page in the front with a search. Now, what most people do in a page, in a uh, performance support mode is they're gonna come in and search for something. They need it quickly, they, they have to solve a problem. So they come in and they search, and then we can take them really quickly to, oh, add or delete a page. That's the thing I needed to do. Let's go there and open up. And, and as it turns out, there are like six different ways to add pages, so we've got them all listed in the same place. Now. 
But from the authoring perspective, it's this white space here that we've actually made. So that's the page that we've made. All the other stuff is, is a wrapper that we're adding through the, mm -hmm. the, the knowledge base. So this page, because it does have steps, it could totally still be a page. Uh, it could also easily be at, added as a page, <laughs> pardon me, in an e-learning course. The content that you've made now becomes a lot more usable for both formal learning in, a, in an LMS as a, as a SCORM package, but also as informal learning um, to help people later on. You know, you've, they've taken those five courses in the LMS and they can do those tasks, but two months go by before they're back on the job and they actually do one of those. Well, using the same content but repurposing it as a knowledge base, minimal additional effort. Um, but a really uh, beneficial uh, value add for you as an organization, plus actually being able to help people do things on the job instead of, you know, bothering the, the person in the next cubicle or, or whatever to try to figure something out. So now when so you that, publish, that, do you that, publish that, to that, different LMSs? Uh, so, yeah, we published to, to you know, SCORM 1.2, SCORM okay. 2004, anything you've made. So that, that pretty much covers off. All the, plus, we are always uh, and always have been AICC uh, okay. uh, compatible as well. Um, and, but we've also got really, I would describe us as as industry leading support for um, for XAPI. Okay. Um, and that's that's our other big uh, been another big passion of ours in the last two or three years, um, because for us the, the you know the fact that you can publish a knowledge base. Well, it just, it's not sitting in your LMS anymore. It's going to be sitting on a URL because you don't want people to have to go into the knowledge base to, or into the LMS to then find the knowledge base course and then launch it and dig in. You want people to get there quickly. So you put it on a, on a server location, give them the URL. But with XAPI, you know, now we can start tracking patterns. What are the things that, uh, in an example like this, what are the things that people are searching for? That helps us understand the problems that they might be having in their, uh, in their work. Or, um, you know, what are the most commonly visited pages and those kinds of patterns as okay. well. To, so the XAPI is something that we're, we're really quite bullish about. We, we just see so much value in it for that content that isn't locked in your LMS. All that other content that, uh, that you need to create to help people perform uh, on the job. That's great. So those two things have been, as I say, two big passions: the the responsive authoring mode, plus the um, the, the XAPI uh, stuff that we've been doing have been uh, um, anyway been very strong focuses for us for the last uh, the last couple of years. That's really good. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I just had a, a mind gap for a moment there too. Um, I, I think thinking, it's but, Thursday. Uh, I think we're all going through the yeah. same thing. Um. <laughs> it, it, it might just be that it's getting, it's starting to feel almost like we should be tipping into Friday mindset, yep. right? Yeah. Yep. Oh, we do have a few other things um, in in the works, targeted for later uh, this year for launch. Uh, some other things around informal learning that we're really quite excited about, and we'll, you know, folks will be hearing lots more about that stuff um, as I say as the as the year progresses. Not in a place yet where, where I can show it off, okay. but, uh, but but you know we are teasing it out uh, that we have something really kind of uh, kind of neat and unique coming forward to again moving the you know moving the meter uh, the yardstick in a sense to um, help span the the bigger spectrum of learning whether it's formal learning or uh, in the LMS or informal learning um, outside of your LMS. Now let's talk a little bit about learning content management because mm -hmm. that's another part of what you do. And, and this is an area where a lot of people are just totally beyond confused. We've walked into shops where they say, we just bought an LCMS. I go, great, what are you going to do with it? Well, it's going to write 75% of our training. And how's it going to do that? Uh, <laughs> they told us it would do that? No. Yeah. They probably told you you could create 75% of your content and maybe reuse it. What's that? Reusability. How do you do yeah. that? And so you go through this and they have no clue. So they go into an LCMS and then they blame the LCMS vendor for not understanding what they bought. Um, but in essence, a lot of instructional designers are not into database management. They're not into reusability of objects and code and graphics and everything else. How, how do you handle the reusability of objects? Because like you said in the beginning, you could, you could put in pieces, headers, footers, content mm -hmm. and drag it out when, where you need it. In essence, you could have it one time in your database and then you just drag it out to each course as needed. Is that pretty much what you guys are doing? 
Yeah, so we, we have uh, content management and reuse for us comes at two different levels. Um, I've just opened up the media library in this site. So okay. um, if I've made a whole bunch of things um, that all need our company logo in them. Mm -hmm. So I, the first time I upload it and add it to a page that I'm working on, it's also automatically stored in the, in the library. Okay. Okay. And then moving forward, I just keep using it from the library over and over again. And you can see, um, hopefully, at least on the screenshot on the left side, on the right side here, there's a list. So this graphic of our logo is being used right now in five different pages in five different projects. And if the marketing team tells me, Chris, there's a new logo, it's different colors or something, I just come to the library and I upload the new one and it will automatically replace it across all of those okay. uh, pages that are using it. So, And that applies to uh, uh, assets like uh, audio files, video files as okay. well, or even PDFs and Word docs, things that people might download uh, uh, you know, while they're experiencing something. Um, so that's, you know, we call that the asset level of, of content mm -hmm. management and content reuse. Yep. Um, but for us as well, we have, um, if, if you're making something in PowerPoint, you're, you're making just a, really a string of pages. Um, but in our tool, what you can do is you can add, um, you can work at a, a level of, of thinking about the topics or in the jargony term, the learning objects uh, within a course. So in the sample that I've got up on the screen, I've got this introduction and it has three pages in it, but it's the, it's that, it's one particular topic or learning object. And then there's another one here, types of security threats, which also happens to have um, three pages of content in it. For us, that topic, is also a shareable level of content okay. reuse. So this topic here, types of security threats, I've got a little double icon as opposed to the single squares here. And that's telling me that, hey, this is being used in more than one place right now. And over here on this panel, I can see that it's being used in three different projects. So kind of like that image, um, if my colleague Paul, who currently has this checked out to work on it, um, did any changes, maybe added a page, took a page away, changed a typo, etc. Um, this topic only exists once in the system and it's being used, it's being shared in all three of these projects um, within the system. So mm -hmm. whenever it's being updated, we're updating it in all the places that are, that are sharing it. And what's really nice about this approach is that if you had a PowerPoint deck with 50 slides in it, and this week you're teaching to group X, Mm -hmm. Well, next week you're teaching to group Y, and they're in maybe a different region or something. So 50 pages, six of those pages have to change. Um, so what do you do? You duplicate the PowerPoint deck, and now you've got two with six pages that are different. Mm -hmm. A month goes by, and you're going to redo those two groups again, but there's some stuff in those other 44 pages that's changed. Well, now you've got to update it in two different PowerPoint decks and remember that you've done it there. Um, in our model, those 44 pages of content are actually shared. So you only need to update it once and you've dealt with it then, uh, you know, for all the places that are sharing that. So it really simplifies your long-term con content maintenance, um, makes it really easy to, uh, you know, you can bring content together from different projects and um, mix and match them. So you might have some content that's shared and some content that's, you know, unique to any given audience as well. So really, but it simplifies the maintenance process long-term. So if you're in a team environment, let's say you've got four or five people developing, they could be working on different parts of a project and be sharing the same content. They would all see the same content no matter where they were in different locations. They'd be yeah, able to. Totally. That's great. That's nice. Yeah. yeah. And, and you can, so you can see that for us, um, that content level of, 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 of being checking out and authoring. So my colleague Paul is currently working on that. Another colleague, Jessica, is currently working on, on that. Um, I can see when she was last working, you know, in the tool. Um, and then the ones that don't have icons, well, those are the ones that this one happens to be checked in. No one's doing it, but this one, I've got it checked out. So I don't see myself in the tree because I know it's me. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's, you know, three of us right now are actually collaborating in this same project. So that's great. And I noticed you can also lock content. Yeah. So the, well, the little lock icon is telling me that someone else has it checked out okay. right now. So I can't edit it while she's working on that. Um, which is just good safety practice. You don't, you, want you don't like chaos. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. But yeah, I mean, you know, another small thing when if I'm working on this and I'm finished it and I check it back in, um, I make some changes or I make, um, I make a comment of what I've done. Oh, nice. So you can annotate what you're doing and they can see those comments. 
Totally. So if I nice. just look uh, over at the panel on the right hand, when I double click on the, uh, the topic um, and I go to the history, well, there's the check-in that we just did, finished edits for 2018. So because we're a web-based tool, we also know who's coming and going within the tool. We know who's been working on what pieces of content. We know, you know the kinds of things that they were doing. Uh, did they add pages? Did they um, you know, add an image to a, a page? Those kinds of things. Which is, you know, uh, ties us then into the idea of, of content security. Mm -hmm. um, being a web-based tool, if someone leaves your organization, you simply turn off their account. You have all of the things that they've ever made or worked on. Sure. You're not wondering if, gee, did they lose it on their hard drive? Uh, did they actually, in the week before they left, did they actually move all the things from their hard drive to the network folder mm -hmm. where it was supposed to go, or were they, or was their departure kind of nasty and they decided to wipe the hard drive entirely? Mm -hmm. you, you know, your organization has control and and, and storage and ownership uh, of the content and control over who has access and privileges to it as well. That's so. really good because I, I know a lot of groups work within Dropbox or other similar kind of environments to share content. And you probably heard of this. It's amazing how often things get deleted from, oh, we once had one person delete 27 gigs of content off Dropbox. <laughs> Everybody's wow. Going, Where did our graphics library go? <laughs> Holy it was, cow. But they didn't yeah. know. They thought they were deleting one item and deleted the whole folder. Um, yeah. And there's not a lot of protection against that other than everything's backed up, but then you've got to wait till it's restored, blah, blah, blah. And it becomes a pain. Um, and everybody's at, at that moment frozen. They can't work on anything because it's gone. So yeah, it's joyful sometimes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There, there are other you know models or other ways of doing things that are kind of similar. But um, you know, our approach is that the site is owned by and controlled by the organization. It's their sure. you know IP, their their uh, intellectual property, um, and we give them tools then to control who has access to it and who can author and who can um, who can. Um, you know, author anything versus who can author only some things. So. No, that's great. One thing I've, I've been appreciating watching what you did is you also have contrast in what you're designing, which is good. You can actually read it. Ah. <laughs> it's amazing you, how much stuff is unreadable on the web. <laughs> do you know, we've become, uh, yeah, working in the HTML and HTML5 um, is by by nature, compared to working in Flash anyway, mm -hmm. it tends to be much more accessible, especially yes. the, to screen readers, <clears throat> etc. Um, but we have um, we have a very high profile client in the um, the UK government that hmm. has in the last couple of years really been a, a, and another uh, private sector client as well two really forward thinking groups um, that have really strong testing labs for yep. for different accessibility pieces and mm -hmm. we've learned so much from them and we've been yeah. able to to put a lot of that both into the, the product itself to make those. Um, people, you know, folks who are using a screen reader to make that uh, content much more accessible to them. Right, but then right, also like, just the like, design ideas of, yep. you know, contrast and those sorts of things. Oh, sure. That, yeah, I've gotten to the point. Well, and I'll tell you something about me. I've got a, a, an eye disease called retinitis pigmentosa, okay. which is basically low contrast. If I see something in low contrast, I may not see it. Um, right. Because there's not enough for there for me to read. And it's like, oh, yeah, yeah. It's hard on the web nowadays trying to read half the websites. And so, and I've gotten to the point I use the inverter in, in just the uh, magnifier in Windows. And it does a pretty good job, but the colors people are using don't even invert well. So you're basically going, okay, I can't read it this way or that way. Ha, ah, gosh. Uh, the, the other way is such a, a weird color combination. It's exactly. It's like an epileptic seizure or something. Yeah, it's, it's just, just a, really yeah. bizarre. You go, okay, now what yeah. color is this? It's just bizarre. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, there's, and all we have to do is go back to playing contrast. It's... There's no beauty in lack of readability. I haven't figured that one out yet. But uh, yeah, you know, when I'm looking at your stuff, it's very readable. It's got a dark background, light text, boom, can't miss it. Um, yeah. Whereas, and if you invert it, it'll invert very well too because it's the exact opposite color combinations. So those are just little things. And it's funny, I noticed that because I, I get hit by websites all the time where I'm going, oh man, that's so hard to read. Um, yeah. And, uh, Do you know, the, the accessibility is something that for as long as I can remember, there's been, you know, if you get an RFP or something, particularly for government mm -hmm. uh, related agencies, it's yep. always been there as a checkbox. Yes. Um, but in the last two or three years, it's become part of more of a normal conversation with people mm -hmm. about the content. It's, it's certainly awareness of it has increased in the last two or three years in particular. 
Um, and that's really awesome to see that uh, that folks have, have brought that forward in their thinking too. Well, I think part of the part of the issue there is you've got an aging workforce which doesn't read or see. As anybody over forty is already starting to become presbyopic, meaning things are getting smaller and they need longer hands to, to be able to focus. And um, and then you've got a younger workforce who can see, you know, micro dots on a screen and they go, I, I don't have a problem. Wait till yeah. they're 40. They'll be blind by 40 at the rate they're going. So it, it's interesting, but why would anyone design apps that aren't even contrast-based because nobody can read them? And, and you're working eight hours a day on this and uh, it can drive you crazy. I actually met with a major vendor I'll, I'll, they'll remain unnamed, but they're big, um, and they have a major authoring tool. And they, I complained about the interface a lot, and they didn't believe me until they got over ten thousand complaints. And then they went, "Oh, you were right." And and it's just, I go, just add a little, make it blacker on the text, not light blue or light gray on white. You can't read that. Uh, simple things, nothing that complex to fix. And um, and once they did that, all of a sudden everybody went, "Oh, the interface is fine." Hmm. Yeah, and, and the content that people are making, organizations obviously have their own, um, the, an easy ability for them to create their own um, CSS and style yep. sheets and everything to, you know, to be in control of those colors and such. Yep. Um, you're not, we mean, we have a number of color schemes and stuff out, right. you know, available for everything out of the box, but it's totally customizable to an organization well, that's and great. standards. And since most of that is driven by companies, their marketing teams, and they've had to think about that usually with website designs and those kinds of things that those kinds of considerations tend to also then trickle down into the designs that uh, companies are, are the color schemes and the branding and the look and right. feel etc that, that the companies are making for themselves too so yeah, that sounds good did you want to come back to the uh, to the screen sure let me just where did we go there we went there you are there I am that was, that was good. I and it, and I, I know it's late, it's late. it's fairly late your time after a whole day. So I know how you feel about every so often you just go, what, where was I? Oh, right. Um, you know, you work in the mental world. It's a lot of, lot of uh, what, what did I read one time? I think the, um, the brain consumes over 75% of the oxygen in the body. That's a lot of wow. oxygen. And uh, it's amazing. I used to hassle my dad because I would say, hey, dad, come on, you're not in good shape anymore. And uh, you know, all you do is sit down at your job, and he's looking at me like, one day you'll understand. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I was, I was in my 20s and, and working out and teaching martial arts and all this. I was going, come on, Dad, you're really a, kind of a slacker. And, of course, now I'm, I'm in my early 60s going, oh, man, I'm tired after a full day's work because all you're doing is working on stuff that's mental. It, it is a difference. It's fun. but it's, it's always humbling when we reach a point where we realize all of those things that our parents might have said to us all along, and you kind of go, oh, that's what they meant by yep. this. Yeah. You'll yeah. understand someday, son. That's right. And then you'll pay for it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so hey, Chris, that was great. Uh, like you know, I hope you come back on sooner. If we don't invite you, remind us. It's not that we don't care. Okay. We just sometimes get busy and forget. And plus, we, we cut the show for about a year and a half, so we didn't do it. And then we came back about a year and a half ago, and um, and we decided to start doing it. And we're going back to, to people like you who we really enjoyed the first time. So it's it's fun having you on and showing what you and you have changed a lot. It's is pretty uh, pretty radical improvement from where you were. So that's cool. It's cool to see that kind of stuff happening. And and I also really like the way you've got that whole you know really source management mechanism built into the the learning development. So you don't have to really live in a chaotic atmosphere because it gets crazy sometimes and yeah that that solves a big problem yeah it, keeping track of things we i had a call with the client team i don't know in the last uh, couple of months where uh, they said look we have to do something we have all of these courses that were made in a, in a tool but we don't know where they are we don't know where mm -hmm. any of the source files are like we have yeah. literally lost <clears throat> everything um and yeah you know that happens unfortunately more than more than people want to you know think about oh so. you know what is funny i think we've kept half of our clients because we give them our source when we're done we put it on their yeah. servers and we tell them where it is and <laughs> without that and a lot of vendors don't and you just shake your head and go yeah. why wouldn't you they pay for yeah. it and and frankly uh that doesn't make for repeat business either because people feel like they got ripped off or anything else and it's not good good strategy to do and and as a client they should be asking for the code or at least 
something because if anything happens, they have nothing. Uh, or they mismanage it too, which is another issue. Um, and then, of course, after they have somebody develop it, they don't know how to fix it because they don't have anybody on staff who knows it. So they have that problem. And so that's, that's always the kind of things that we run into. And it, it's best to just give people what they paid for and they're happy. Yeah, for sure. And uh, odds are, if you're a vendor in that relationship, odds are you're going to get the call when it needs to be updated anyway, because that's probably that's true. the more efficient thing, because that's why they reached out you know, to a vendor yeah. oper opportunity in the first sure, place, too. That's true. Yeah, we have, we have some client teams that, you know, they have the site, but they do most of the development work through third-party vendors, but they're working in uh, the company's platform site, and therefore, when it's done, you still got it. You know where it is, mm -hmm. and you're not relying on something. Plus, you know, you can do your own maintenance and changes. Sure, you need to change a couple of things. Well, that's not too hard, so you can do that yourself. So, right, that sounds great. Well, Chris, it's been an absolute pleasure seeing you again and going through some of the features of of Claro and Flow, and uh, just getting familiar with what you guys are doing. What's the best way for people to get in touch with you if they want to learn more about the product or get demos yeah. or buy it from you? Yeah, uh, www.domino.com is an easy place to start. Uh, the name sounds great until you try to type it in. So <laughs> D-O-M-I-N followed by K-N-O-W.com. Uh, um, but a quick search of Domino Claro will also pull up the website in, in Google. That's probably a good way to winnow it down. Even if you've got the Domino typed wrong, you'll find us that way. Um, lots of opportunities to contact us uh, you know, through the, through the website if people are interested in learning more. We do have a, a weekly uh, product overview webinar that people can sign up for right on the website to get a, a bit more right. detail uh, of you know, how things work and uh, understand it, it, it a bit more um, it, you know, a bit more to see if it's something that might help them solve something that they're doing. So that's right on the website. There's a big yellow demo button that you just pick and you can sign up there. And obviously a contact button there too if you just want to reach out and, and get in touch with us. Sounds great. Well, Chris, again, a pleasure. And we look forward to seeing you next time. Hope I see you at one of the shows too. And are yeah. you going to uh, DevLearn? Um, well, uh, my fate at Devlin will be turning probably on if I get a speaking session. I did submit a, a session okay. idea, um, and if that's the case, I'll be at Devlin, but the Domino team will be de definitely at Devlin. Oh, great. We're, we're, okay. there, we're there all the time. Um, we have, uh, you know, some other folks will probably be going um, for sure, and it just me personally just depends on uh, largely sure. if, I get a, if I'm coming in as a speaker. Sounds great. Well, anyway, thanks again for coming on, and for yeah. you folks watching, you know how to reach Chris and, and the team at Domino, and we look forward to seeing you again next week. Have a good one, everyone. Thank you much. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.